Welcome back to another episode on our third annual Global ITAM Summit. I have an old friend. I say old. We he's been on the podcast several times, Alexander Golev. Since I'm older than Alexander, I can say old. But it's great to have you back, Alexander. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. I mean, I mean, we're we're both young. We're still in IT, aren't we? And I don't believe it's it's an old industry yet. We can't call ourselves old, but we we can be old friends. That's that's absolutely fine. Yeah. How are you, Jeffrey? I am awesome. I am awesome. I'm I'm excited to hear your thoughts on the Microsoft because what's what's funny to me about Microsoft is we think it's static, right? Like, hey, nothing changes. It's static, but there's so much that goes on in the agreements and the way that Microsoft's trying to position their products that it's very fluid, even though those on the outside see it as static. Is that fair? It's an interesting observation. So Microsoft <coughs> right now is is the uh, is is very far away from being static. Right. Things that are being introduced, think the changes that we're seeing are actually <laughs> revolutionary. Uh, if I may say so. Uh, so on the surface, if you look at the just the traditional licensing, nothing is changing. Nothing has been changing in the traditional licensing for a few years, which was quite a surprise. But then that is the problem. If you only look at the traditional on-premises licensing and you don't notice what's going on in the cloud and with the CSP, then you're not seeing the entire picture. And the entire picture is traditional licensing is dying. Yeah. And... And uh, you know, CSP and cloud is is here, although it may not have yet. I mean, CSP cloud has always uh, obviously been already uh, adopted by enterprises, but CSP is not yet Microsoft uh, customer agreement. But that's a change that's going to happen pretty soon. That's what that's, that's we we're all expecting this and and new licensing models, new perspectives, new. Per there's a whole paradigm shift in, in, in regards to Microsoft, uh, in both from the Microsoft sales point of view and from the enterprise's adoption point of view as well. Microsoft is now seen as a, as a, not as what they were, uh, not the same, it's not the same, it, it doesn't have the same place in business as it had five years ago. It's completely different. Yes. And I agree with you. And I almost see it as like, I always get, you know, whenever I'm scrolling through social media, I always get stopped when I see those sleight of hand guys, you know, where they pull a card out of nowhere and it's the right card. That's how I think about Microsoft with these organizations. They're focused on their on-prem and they're missing so much that's going to hit them like a train, you know, because even the way that so we're not even talking about pricing models or any of that stuff. We're just talking about the way the contracts are structured at that foundational level is changing. Is that correct? Oh, I can, I can, I can even widen this, that perspective. So Microsoft these days, if you look at Azure, is not only your software licensing provider, it's your hardware provider, it's your channel provider, it's your electricity and data center provider. It's basically... I think you cannot live without. They're everywhere. They're replacing your, uh, if you used to procure services, you don't. You now pay for cloud services to Microsoft. They're becoming more strategic. And by the way, that's not happening to other vendors. You know, Oracle is trying to get them to the cloud. They may actually overtake Google at some point, but at this point in time, at this point in time, with all the, uh, efforts uh, uh, Oracle to uh, of Oracle to become a cloud company, they will still be a very niche business. I I don't see an entire enterprise infrastructure to be hosted on Oracle Cloud. There are other things, you know. Oracle right. is Oracle is a segment of uh, what what uh, companies require in IT. And Microsoft, Microsoft is the foundation for the majority of the companies. So obviously, there, there are businesses where Microsoft's uh, share is probably. 20, 30% of the inside infrastructure, they still rely on it. They still need it. Linux-centric companies still have Microsoft environments because it's a de facto standard in the business world. You need to communicate with your partners. It's very difficult to be completely away from, from Microsoft. And 
Yes, and this this is where we are. This is the reality. It's not just licensing now. As I said, it's electricity data center, it's telecom, it's and for Microsoft. They're ubiquitous. So we've talked, we've introduced Microsoft, and and I've loaded every one of these one on one podcasts into different areas with this one opening question: What does good look like from a Microsoft point of view from a client side? Like if you're a client, what does good look like? Good one. I, I think from my point of view, because I consult clients, I don't sell licenses if somebody doesn't know. So we don't sell license, we don't sell cloud. We only consult how to buy and yeah. how to properly protect the investment. So from my, my perspective right now, good looks like you are getting value in return to your investment and not just a, like an imagined or sold value, you know, inflated value that salespeople will be selling to you. And that's what Microsoft is doing really good job in the area. You know, nobody's seeing Microsoft right now as just an expense. And it's good. I mean, I'm, I'm not against it. The thing is, you still need to take off rose tinted uh, sunglasses, yeah. <laughs> aren't they? Yeah. To actually see the actual value. And this is what good looks like. If we're not necessarily these days talking about savings. We're not necessarily these days talking about cutting the expenses. If you want to adopt, by all means adopt, but don't let it just you know stay there. You're paying for it and you're paying for something else that is an alternative solution and you're not getting the value in return for your money. I think with in the cloud era, with the real time uh, SaaS payments, with the migration to the CSP monthly payment billing model, we need to be more aware about not just a point in time ELPs and being, you know, becoming compliant once in a, once a year, once in three years, or when, when an audit hits. Good looks like I'm always aware where my money goes to. Yeah. If it makes sense. And that you can, I'm like, can I take it a step further? And this is a question, even though it sounds like a statement and I can project it against my roadmap because it's not yes. just for today, but it's making sure all my resources are aligned going forward. Is that fair? Absolutely. So we, we stopped creating just pure LPs a few years ago because they don't make sense. And the LP is a snapshot, a point in time snapshot of compliance. It used to work. Nowadays, even my question is, so, so what? And, and, and now even procurement people that, used to, that are used to ELPs, they don't want just pure ELPs. What we do now is we sit down, we talk about the roadmap for at least three years ahead, and then we tell, then we consult, advice on what needs to be done to be, uh, to be compliant, to be resilient, to not to waste money in the next in the next three years, you know, for for the planned period. Yeah. This is this is what licensing uh, more than day licensing looks like. It's not a point in time compliance exercise. It's not uh, a random purchase exercise. It's always a strategic view, strategic approach, finding the place for the vendor in the strategy of the entire organization, and then align them together, and then see how not to waste. That's that is my view. And to take it a step further, if I may, ELP is mm -hmm. mainly for licensing. And now that we're getting into the cloud and all of the, the monthly subscriptions, it's less about ELP and more about managing your utilization versus what you're being charged right. for, right? I agree. I agree with you 100%. Yeah, that's, that's what it is right now. I'm here for you. All right, because I'm trying to make sure that everybody understands ELPs are great if you have online on-premise licensing, but then there's this huge other segment out here that's subscription-based, and we have to manage that differently. Is that reasonable? If, if, if you don't mind, I'll actually I'd like to challenge that because please challenge. even even in the even in the license in the pure licensing world right now, uh, well, again, it's not pure licensing world, isn't it? Even if we look at the license at the licenses, there are digital transformation plans in every organization, I believe, at least in the Western developed world. 
if you have a transformation plan, part of it will be migration to the cloud. So say we're not even touching cloud expenses. We know they sit in a different in different area. We're looking at licenses. If I, as a consultant, if I am only looking at the licenses and, and the point in time snapshot, say preceding an enterprise agreement renewal, my question will always be, what are your digital transformation plans? I'm not even necessarily touching them. You know, some clients say, let's just talk about licensing. Still, we talk about licensing in a three-year perspective. Because I don't know if everybody's watching this aware that some of the licenses may be reused in the cloud. Some may not. Right. You may not just assume, you know, it's, it's a mistake to assume that nothing can be reused in the cloud. So, so all, all, all this investment is purely for on-premise. Some licenses may be taken to the cloud. But on the other hand, the other mistake is to assume that everything will just, you know, will just take it and we'll lift it and we'll shift it. Right. That's not going to happen either. So you need to plan ahead for the next renewal, for the next three to five years of your enterprise agreement. Which licenses are you taking with you? Which licenses are you taking with you to the cloud? And which licenses you'll probably, you probably don't need? And you know, you'll buy them when you, when you need them because, because the ground is shifting. And yeah. therefore, therefore it'll, even, even in relation to pure licensing on-premises, licensing in the Microsoft world, at least, ELPs, pure ELPs stopped making sense. It's, it's a baseline, but it's not the end of the journey. It's a starting point. And uh, so I appreciate you pushing back because I think that was a great point, especially... I'm going to take it a step further. I'm going to contradict what I said earlier. I'm going to take it, your point a step further. Not all of your on-prem licenses, so even if it says it'll go to the cloud, they may not go to every cloud the same, which is a nuance that needs to be understood that if you're lifting and shifting, as you mentioned, going to Azure may not have the same implications as going to Google Cloud, AWS, or some other. Is that correct? It is correct. Microsoft has an unfair advantage in that regard. You may take more licenses and save more money if you move to Azure compared to all the competition. Yep. So in Europe, by the way, I don't know if that's a well-known uh, fact, uh, Across the pond, <laughs> there's a there's an entire movement that may end up being a uh, I don't know maybe maybe a class action or something like that against Microsoft because Microsoft is using Azure as as an unfair advantage compared to other cloud platforms. So you, the licensing rules for Azure and for other clouds are different. Simple as that. They're yeah. different. Yep. That's why, like I said, I don't mind contradicting myself just as we get down this, this pull this thread, right? Because mm. it, it, there's so much nuance that it's hard to cover in a few minutes, but we want to make sure that we help people understand. So we talked about what good looks like. What are some of the steps that we could take to get towards good? Well, I always say, and there's no, it's not, it's not a rocket science. Right. You need to know two things. Where you're right now and where you're going to be in, I always take three years. It may be a different period for you. And then build realistic plans. Then again, it's my personal experience. I, I always say, let's build really, let's put on paper realistic plans. Don't just assume you're going to migrate in one go. Don't just assume you're going to migrate by the end of the year. Let's do a proper planning. Let's do a proper planning. And then also see where we are right now, because what we're seeing is due to fantastic work of salespeople, clients ended up with products and services they're not using right now. So there's 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 unrealized value. There's, uh, there's a value gap between the what they pay for and what they're using. And depending on the roadmap, then you can lay it out looking at, are you, are you going to increase adoption or maybe you should cancel these, these licenses? 
obviously microsoft doesn't because because now they're ubiquitous it doesn't exist in isolation so part of that plan must also include all the alternatives that may be used right now and well let me give you a few very very basic examples any alternative security products when you're paying for microsoft e5 why why are you paying for both box and dropbox when you have SharePoint and, and Teams. Do you still need them? What are you using them for? Maybe you maybe you shouldn't be paying for them because you know you can't really cancel Teams. It's a, it's a built-in feature of any Office 365 plan. So things like that. So you need to look at the whole IT strategy and perspective, including all the you know SaaS services that you're consuming. Why why do you need Salesforce and Dynamics 365 at the same time? Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. Maybe it's maybe it's just something that that was overlooked and you you're paying for Dynamics. But in the last three years, you haven't implemented that. Maybe you should review the strategy. So it is to get to the point when it's good, it takes effort. And it's not as simple as in the, you know, as you know, traditional licensing when you could just look at the an ALP and fix your non-compliance. And it's much more, it's much, it's much, it's much more complicated these days, but you still you still can achieve a, a lot. So an average. An average across the industry, so it's not just my number. You know, if you if you if you uh, research articles, look at Gartner reports, if you look at you know watch YouTube videos, hours and our competitors' YouTube videos, the numbers revolve between fifteen and thirty percent of savings still in the cloud era. If you don't want savings, we can optimize the investment. That's that's another point. But but then again, you know that is the money that is wasted. And when somebody says Microsoft's financial results are great. They've grown by fifteen percent in the last uh, in the last uh, financial year. If you think that the av <laughs> the average overpayment is above fifteen percent, is the entire Microsoft's growth based on the brilliance of their salespeople? Good point. Is it, it just technology, or is it that art of selling the value? Yeah. It's a good point. And, and to that point, almost everybody, Microsoft doesn't pick up new users other than Azure. You know what I mean? Like people aren't like saying, hey, let's switch to 365 or 365. They're already using it. You know, yeah. they're not, they're not market growth other than Azure and some of the other products, but you know, their growth is in the adding new products to their SKU, your new SKUs to the, the line items and people paying for them and not getting rid of the old ones, right? <laughs> well, if I is still not, uh, yes and no. Microsoft 365, which is still their fla uh, flagship product, is not yet really adopted by the majority of the market. I think oh. last figure I heard was 25 to 30%, even less than that. And that was in the States. So when you take into account more conservative countries like Germany, France, I don't know the adoption rates there, but I believe they will be lower because, because even I know that some German companies are very hesitant to even switch from on-premises licensing to, uh, to the cloud licensing. And in addition to that, in the EU, you may resell uh, secondhand licenses. So, mm. so it's, it's a very conservative market. Obviously, American market is much bigger. You know, if you also take into account Canada, uh, so uh, that's where the main influence is. That's probably where the main income is from. Uh, again, I'm not really sure, so I can't be. I can't really say anything about that. But then again, adoption is not that big. But I would agree with you on the other point: is that Azure is growing. Azure is growing rapidly. Yeah. Where I was going, where I was going is people moving from on-prem office to 365. Yes, it may benefit mm -hmm. Microsoft, but people are still paying for Microsoft products. There aren't yeah. they the SKUs they're adding are on the cloud side and on the subscription <laughs> side. That's how yeah. the total spend is going up. You know, people there aren't very many people using non-Microsoft Office Office, you know, solutions, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. There aren't that many. And so, uh, you know, I'm, maybe there is, and you'd see more of it than I do, but I just, you know, it just seems like they're adding more product SKUs to get the spend bigger and bigger and more on a subscription basis. Is that fair? It is. 
It is. I will agree with you. I, I don't have a long uh, um, speech <laughs> to, to respond to that question. I, I'll just agree with you. All right. And the other piece I wanted to push in on, and I think you are 100% right about the three-year plan, is when you make that three-year plan, expect it to change, right? Like, it's not written yeah. in, in ink. It's written in pencil. Because not to be overly uh, sensitive to the last three years, but this last three years have really taught us you can't write that in pen. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like three years ago, we had no idea what was coming. Clients appreciate flexibility these times. Uh, I can I can tell you that. And Microsoft introducing the new commerce experience is taking that flexibility away. And uh, there's a there's a big backlash, but I believe we we can't we we cannot do anything about it. So it 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 is happening. It is already happening. So, but what we try and do is we try to build as much flexibility around you know there's a, there's an art of the possible as you know uh, and where where it's for example possible to fix the price for three years but ramp up usage as you need it will obviously pursue that option because it's an it's an obvious way of uh, cost avoidance it's cost yeah. avoidance it's it's a, it's a, it's a good thing and and therefore as you as you rightfully said about the last three years and the current events, uh, I'd rather be flexible by design than jump into uh, you know current discounts that may actually bite me in two three years time if something happens. Yeah. Oh yeah. Especially in all right for those of us in Europe, we're not as close to all of that's happening in Europe. You know, those in the US, we're not like all that's happening with Europe and Ukraine and Russia. There is a lot of sensitivity to we don't know what the future holds in Europe versus those of us that are a little further away. You know what I'm saying? Like three years is a long time. A lot could happen. Exactly. Exactly. A lot could happen. All right. So on that on that note, We've talked a little bit about this. What disruptions are on the horizon for the Microsoft licensing and subscription to cloud, those areas? Oh, it's uh, it's it's Microsoft CSP, or there's another name that is uh, uh, acronymized as MCA, Microsoft Customer Agreement, because because strictly speaking, CSP is Microsoft Customer Agreement sold through Cloud Solution Partners. So I would try and migrate all you know all the acronyms to MCA because it encapsulates everything. It can, encapsulates clients buying licenses through partners. It encapsulates clients buying licenses directly from Microsoft because that's also now done through the Microsoft customer agreement. That is a new form of agreement. And uh, unsurprisingly, probably, I was, I was going to say surprisingly, not every enterprise, and the larger it is, not every enterprise really knows yet about what that, you know, what it looks like. And what we're seeing is that it started happening in the U.S. market. I think I said it in the in the group interview uh, a year ago. We heard from many partners that sell licenses that Microsoft is trying to push for five-year enterprise agreements. The same is right now going on in Europe, at least in the Western Europe. And what can it possibly be caused by? We're thinking that Microsoft will get rid of the enterprise agreement and will migrate everybody into this new licensing reality. The problem with it is that although you're buying the same products, the licensing rules in CSP or MCA are different. Okay. So that is something that needs to be really, really closely watched. And if somebody sells an uninformed client new licenses because they're more flexible or there's another benefit, there are benefits to MCA. They don't necessarily tell everything and they don't even necessarily know every single risk that this switch entails. I have, I, have, I have a very long 20 minute video on my channel, Some Expert TV, that explains the very basics. And, and imagine that it's a basic video, but it takes 20 minutes to explain it. <laughs> so if I put it in a few sentences, I just want to remind everyone who's not heard about it yet that when you 
are offered a new Microsoft licensing, new form of a Microsoft licensing agreement, always ask just one question, how is it going to affect my terms and conditions? Yes. Expect differences. Expect differences to break your entire IT. This may happen as well. Expect that some products are not yet available in the new licensing uh, program. This may change. This may change, but it's happening already right now. It's not even on the horizon. It's already there. It's 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 come. You know, it's twenty twenty two. This is the reality. And when Microsoft flips the switch on the enterprise agreement, this will probably become the only way to procure licenses. Wow. So get, get ready. We are expecting Microsoft to actually widen the range of the available products because of that. And there are already noises and rumors from inside Microsoft, not confirmed yet. I would say you know, there, there are certain, there, there's been a number of blog posts this week that hint at the uh, uh, increase of the offered product base, product list through, through MCA. Uh, that there were hints at Microsoft introducing similar bundling and long-term uh, commitments in CSP. So maybe they will bring everything from the enterprise agreement to the CSP at some point, but right now the switch is dangerous. <laughs> I'm not saying you shouldn't. I think you should just understand very clearly if you switch, nothing's going to break in your IT. And, and this, this, is, this is something that's going on in, 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 in licensing. In the cloud, on the, on the cloud side, well, it's, it's just Office 365 and Azure. What may happen is we're expecting Microsoft when the adoption of a five grows to introduce maybe a new plan. This may happen. I don't believe it's, it's gonna be a make it or break it change. What's going on with agreements may be a make it or break it change. So on the, let me summarize and you tell me if I'm right. To make sure if you sign something new, you take full time to understand the T's and the C's. And my analogy, Alexander, is you already have this in your environment and you're already using it a certain way and it could change. It would be like taking your car on the, the same car on the same road, but now all the traffic laws have changed. And yep. you have to change the way you drive. So this would change how you use those licenses and that technology that you already have in your infrastructure, in your environment. Is that fair? You've, you've captured it correctly. And so you need to make sure you understand the rules before you put the keys and start your car. And mm. uh, so yep. you mentioned your YouTube channel. And you have a lot of great content out there. Will you uh, make sure that everybody knows how to get there and uh, what, what type of content you have? Well, firstly, you can Google my name, <laughs> Alexander Golub. Or you can go to samexpert.com, which is our main website, the business website, or samexpert.tv, which is a redirect to our YouTube channel. They're cross links, so you can get from one to another. Uh, I will spell it. It's S A M. Software Asset Management, samexpert.com or samexpert.tv. Gotcha. I just want to make sure that people can find you. So as we Thank close, you, any parting words, Alexander? Uh, these days, you know, I, I wish everybody peace on earth and, uh, you know, less, less, less stress. Yeah. And in, in our professional, uh, in our professional uh, area, don't stress it too much. Adopt. The cloud is here. Uh, learn, new, learn new things. Look at FinOps. Uh, evolve with the evolving reality and you'll be fine. <laughs> Just always keep changing. Always. Yes. Everything changes. <laughs> and, you know, the, the one thing that I never knew as I, when I was younger is we have to accept the certainty of uncertainty. And that is a mm. hard one for us as until we're ready. And uh, I mean that with a smile on my face that we have to accept that as difficult as this. So Alexander, thank you for joining us on this and sharing your expertise. We'll have you on again. You've been on several times and uh, thank you once again for joining us. 
Thank you, Jeffrey. Always a pleasure. Yes, sir. Have a great day. Bye. <laughs> and to you. Bye-bye.